Okay, hello, welcome everyone to the cartographer community meeting. Today is December the 8th, and uh, well, let's get started. Let me share my screen with the agenda. Uh, there you go. Okay, yeah, thank you, Emily. <laughs> I think I have to do the same, you know, to put there my name. Uh, under the attendees list that will help us to keep up the conversation even after the meeting and remember all sessions are recorded and stored in the YouTube um, VMware Cloud Native Apps YouTube channel under the Cartographer Community Meetings playlist. All right, um, welcome everyone. We don't see exactly new faces, but we are happy to see you here um, again. Okay, so the TLDR um, is our first section where we try to summarize what's new in the project this week, what team is working on. I, I try to contribute at least one item there. One thing that it's definitely new and it's, uh, it, it will be really useful for the community out there. It's having architecture and troubleshooting docs. Uh, it's open for feedback. I've been uh, reading it, using it, and it's, you know, it's sent from heaven because I, I, I as a user, I've been longing to, to have this overview and see, you know, visually see all the concepts how they relate to each other so um it's going to be very useful but again if uh, users out there have uh, uh, opportunities to improve and uh, they have ideas or suggestions uh, to the docs uh, please please feel free to open up issues um so so we can triage and and work on it. And also there's a new um, troubleshooting section, or troubleshooting guide. All of these, you can check it. Um, you, you will be able to see it right now in the development uh, version here. Um, and it, it has, you know, it's, it's very informational because I've, I found this problem uh, several times, you know, the missing value at PAT and uh, not having a clear, um, you know, not having clear guidelines on what to do next. So this is really good because it has, uh, you know, missing value at path seems to be a, a kind of a generic or, or one of the most common unknown states. And it has information what to do uh, on different conditions when this uh, message can come up. So thank you for, for this. Thank you to the team for working on this. It will be really useful. And for folks out there, again, it's open for feedback. That's great. There you go, link is there. So yeah, I, I will say, but I don't know if someone else from team would like to summarize what was new and what team is working on. I will say that uh, a, a good chunk of, of the work right now has to do with docs, but I'm, I'm sure there's more. So um, I don't know. It, 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 yeah, please go ahead. Were service accounts new this week? They, are, they landed this week, right? Okay. Let me check. I could be wrong. They might have been last week, but it's still very, very useful stuff that came in this week. Yeah, I think we talked about reducing controller permissions last week. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it was last week. Yeah, it's, right. it's no, no problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a big one because it was even oh, uh, <laughs> a lot of comments. It was even at, at, at the top of our readme page, so it's, it's great to see it there. That's it. Anything else on a summary of what team is working on right now? Nope. Sorry, I was muted. Um, no. 
yeah, we're, along with the docs, we're working on getting some new, uh, our example has, we've always had one example and we're looking yeah. to break that into kind of a tiered example. Here's like, just get your thing to prod. Here's get your thing to prod with testing. Here's get your thing to prod using uh, a GitOps flow. Um, and then also on our um, short term horizon is uh, upgrade testing. Um, I think we're just at the very beginning of that. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, just a question, is that upgrading of cartography itself or say upgrading a, um, a supply chain? Upgrading, making sure that we, upgrading cartographer itself, making sure that when cartographer releases a new version, that'll be a smooth experience. Uh, again, I would say that we are at the at the opening stages of uh, that story. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. And there was also infrastructure testing started this week too. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, um, from previous meeting, we had a couple of action items. Well, one of it is uh, already in the works. Uh, I've been uh, talking to Hector and Tiffany on what will be uh, working on the uh, demo for the CNCF that we discussed in the, in the previous meeting. Um, they see it's a great idea to come up with um, with a proper demo, you know, meeting the requirements there that we discussed uh, last week. So that's already in the works. And there was another to, it was to run a naming exercise for the blueprint classifier. So I don't know if that's something we could do right now, because there, there were several ideas there. We have cemented on Blueprint and owner at the moment in the docs. Not that yeah. I'm against it being reviewed, but it was the idea that there was going to be an actually like a well-structured naming exercise. Yeah, what well, it, Daniel suggested. Yeah, he, he suggested that uh, I haven't run a naming exercise before. I think it's it's more. Uh, uh, on, on the PM skills, <laughs> but um, but yeah, certainly I, I saw in the docs that Blueprint, Blueprint, and Owner is still there. Uh, but just to mention that there are several other ideas, and we could, with a little help, um, and, you know, to structure a proper naming exercise if there's a need to. Um, Change the naming for those um, oh, for the classifiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same for myself. I I find I think Blueprint is a great name. Um, I would be voting for it if if we ran such an exercise. Um, I'm not super hot on owner, but I also haven't heard a name that I am super hot on. So I don't. I wouldn't want to take precious cycles to spin on that. Maybe the recommendation here is until someone gets upset, <laughs> we just settle for these because they work and and they are defined in the docs at last, which I think helps a little. Okay, I agree. That's great. Cool. Um, great. Now for uh, I don't know if there's any other um, regarding blueprint. If not, we can move to the open mic discussion. This is from Marty, I believe. Yeah, we talked about this in the uh, office hours meeting uh, and I had to drop a bit early, but this was the uh, the outcome was, it was decided that we would remove the RBAC informers because of the issue with the informers handling a lot of the same logic that the controllers have. Um, and I did, I left some follow-up questions in there. Um, I see Scott answered it a few, a little while ago. Um, but yeah, I guess I just wanted to revisit this discussion because if we 
remove them, right? Like Scott, you said, what about the, the regular back off for a failed reconciliation? I like the problem with that is unless you really fix the roles within the first minute or two, then who knows how long you have to wait till it reconciles again. And then it's essentially useless. You may as well, you know, if you're just going to end up deleting and reapplying your workload. So it, I think the, the default back off is useless for people in that regard. Right. Um, and so like, if we say we'll reconcile every five seconds, then you're, you know, at, once we have this permissions failure. Okay. So then we're going to just constantly have logging of constantly re-reconciling with the same error. Or do we say, okay, fine. So we'll limit that. Like this said, like long polling, like sounds like there was some sort of time frame we thought was reasonable. I was like, is it reasonable to do every five seconds for 10 minutes? Like, like it seems a little bit arbitrary at that point. Um, so I don't feel like there's a great solution to solve this without informers, unless we want to say like, okay, this is one thing we don't inform on. Go for it, Rash. So I, I, you, you had to leave, which was unfortunate, but the, I dived in and what I was just hoping to get to was, I think it was more of a heuristic that that having sort of like controller code you know, like in an expansive map reduce felt messy to you and i understood that and i feel like we could remove that complexity there we don't need to go adding it anywhere else until users have serious issues with or take serious issue with it so the heuristic is why don't we wait to see if it's a big problem for users to do something other than either use an exponential back off? I personally don't like the exponential back off because it can make debug a little hard and noisy. I'd like it to be for really truly exceptional scenarios. So that's why I was asking, could we just use a long pole? And a long pole that still lets users get something resolved maybe before they go, oh, I'm done with this and I'll delete and reapply, right? And I was thinking 10 minutes or something like that, you know? Uh, but that's where my thoughts were in asking this was just to keep the code light until there was a real user concern that meant that our code needed to be heavier than it needs to be or, or than it is today. I say anecdotally, background. like as a user myself, I've ran into this issue. Like when we were first doing this and we limited the controller permissions, the first thing we did was, okay, apply a workload and just see which roles we absolutely need to get going. Like that's how we made the example. And it was brutal to keep deleting and reapplying. And that's when we said, okay, maybe we should have informers. And like, I've seen conversations in, I, I don't know how, which Slack they were in, but like, I've seen conversations where people said like, oh, I have this error I'm missing a permission. And the answer we're, we've been able to give is just like, add this role and you'll be good. Now the answer is going to be add this role either wait a few minutes or delete and reapply your workload. And like, that's only anecdotal. So like maybe, you know, maybe more users won't hit that, but it feels like they're going to. And I, I did like, I did like Scott's suggestion of kind of doing kind of both, like keeping the controller logic out of the informers. And so like mapping a service account to a workload can happen in the workload and it can, we can create an in-memory mapping, but the work of like a role to a service account has nothing to do with cartographers in workings and that can stay, you know, higher up. But I'm just nervous that this long pulling is a light solution that won't actually end up solving anything and it's not worth it. Then why don't we keep the code you've got now until more misery arises? Another like the code you've got is working, right? It just doesn't feel cool. All right because it solves the problem that you you saw it just maybe doesn't feel architecturally as sound as maybe something else like i think it's not just in this case right it's also in mapping workloads to supply chains and deliverables to deliveries we have the same problem there like now that we do best match labels we have to do the same best match in the informers to make sure we're actually informing on the right you know we're actually reconciling the correct workloads and like we fixed that, or there's a PR to fix that. I think it was merged like to fix it in the informer. So it has the same logic that the controller has for best match matching. Uh, to be honest, I think that the, the map reduce functions that make, that make up the, I want to be informed for this. 
uh, because this controller needs to be informed when any of these things change. We can just wholesale pick up that logic and put it in the same namespace as the reconciler for it, and then call that from the call that from the the note of the, the sorry words escaping what we call a watch informer informer thank you <laughs> from the informer and then we would at least have localized code that makes sense as why it exists we can test it in isolation and still depend on it until such time as we need to do in memory maps which i think are riskier personally um but scott does have some suggestions that there were there is a tool that we should in maybe investigate the i think it's the k native one that is designed to set up in memory mapping for informers is that right scott yeah i um, wouldn't necessarily use the kind of implementation but that pattern yeah it's uh, like... so the, the, the general pattern is that as you're reconciling the resource you basically know what resources you need to actually successfully reconcile that resource so as you're going through you can basically say this is a resource that when it changes i want to re-reconcile the resource that I'm reconciling, um, or at least add it back onto the test queue. Uh, so basically, it's that case you're defining the mappings there so that later when you're watching informers for those other types of resources, you can then inverse that listing and then reschedule the appropriate resources. Could we dive into what I actually think are like the, the risks of that? Because I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, so like, I mean, Scott just said, you know, well, I wouldn't necessarily use that one. And I'm like, well, wait. <laughs> so it, what we create our own or we find one that we make sure is tested well. And then that we now adopt a practice for testing that, that those mappings work and that we do also delete them so that we're not creating unnecessary, or maybe we don't care, but I feel like over time we'd start to build up the size of the cache and we might want to not <laughs> when we have deletes and make sure that we do the correct like if something, if a reference in there is now changed, because we do that a lot when we apply, we now have logic to say, take that one out and put this one in. Those are my concerns. Whereas MapReduce is very straightforward in my mind. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend it if there wasn't a client side uh, transparent cache, which we get to free from controller runtime. That's why I recommend it because it's very straightforward to say from these map down to these results. Um, and they're easily tested versus uh, an in-memory cache. Map producers are just, I think, naturally easier to test. That, that, those are my, my thoughts. And just to clarify, my only criticism against the Knative one is just that it is included inside of Knative package, which has a bunch of other stuff and a bunch of other dependencies. Um, so it's kind of a big dependency to bite off. Um, so, so a copy paste? Uh, that's effectively library. what I did to pull it into Reconciler runtime, which is that's a what KPAC did too. Library, yeah. Uh, I think KPAC is still using Knative package, if I'm correct. Maybe they switched away from it. Oh, they might be. Um, but uh, I basically did that copy paste into Reconciler runtime, uh, which is a library that I maintain. Um, but you could also copy and paste into that. Also, like it's 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 one type with like a helper function. It's not that much code. I still, I still think a couple of the things I mentioned remain, which is you do have to be aware that the graph is no, it can get invalidated and maybe there are side effects to that. All right. You, Matt, you don't necessarily care um, okay. because what happens is that worst case is you're just in queuing additional resources to be reconciled. So like a reconcile, an additional reconciler running against a resource is like, a no op if there's nothing to do. So there, there would be like in memory a little bit of there would be in memory growth or something like runnable. It would just constantly grow if we didn't remember to prune it. I think there so are side the effects. One, the one that's implemented uh, basically just has a, a time based expiration of the keys. Uh, it's also like so it's basically naturally... set by default to two x the resync interval. Yeah, like oh, so that it gets so the resync causes it to be rebuilt anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was about to say. Yeah. All right. That's pretty tidy. Yeah, I mean, all credit to the design goes to the Canada folks, and I don't know where if they copied it from somewhere else or where they came up with it, but it's not original to me. I'm 
I'm concerned we may have lost our host. Be oh, oh, no, never mind. Oh, sorry. Somehow sharing was posted. I don't know. Uh, no, but I'm still here. No problem. Yeah, your um, screen wasn't wasn't updating, but yeah, I'm glad was, you're here. I mean, uh, no problem. Okay, great. Um, great discussion. Anything else regarding this specific issue? I think it's an ongoing conversation. Oh, um, I think the action item is that if it's meaningful enough, there needs to be a, some demonstrable code written, right? Yeah, can we leave the code that's in there now and then have a separate story to just switch out oh, all I'll the con that. controller logic? Go ahead and write up an issue for that. Okay, great. So the action item will be to create a new issue for... Okay. Mm, uh... Yeah. Refactoring the informers, I guess. Okay. Okay, and that will be you, Marty? Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Mm, okay, for next one. Yeah, so okay, pattern sentence. Um, this is just in writing the examples for users of cartographer. Um, there, uh, I wrote this sentence. It's it is true. It's how cartographer is set up right now, and it seems to cut in direct opposition to um, one of the goals, which is developers shouldn't have to know what's going on with the workloads, um, and uh, the way permissions work right now, the developer has to know exactly what the workload, or the developer has to know exactly what the supply chain is going to stamp out um, in order to create RBAC rules for the controller to do that stamping. Um, and I just, yeah, I uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't like writing that sentence. And so I wanted to bring that up at a meeting. Just put a link in the chat. Um, you can the supply chains can now create and reference service accounts at the supply chain level, and so if the developer did not fill out the service account name field, it would default to what's set in the supply chain, and so it could be on the operator. If we want to write the docs in such a way that the developer doesn't care, we could put it that the onus on the operator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I. Uh, I think that is a better, a better default. Yeah, we will do. Was this about just the service account name or was this also about creating an RBAC rules for the resources in the supply chain? I, it was whose responsibility is it to reference that service account? Is it the developers or is it the operators? Got it. We, we allow that to be specified in both places. So you could just do it the operator side. Okay, that makes sense. There's there's another question of like if you're setting up our back rules, you probably don't want to set star. <clears throat> and so then the developer for to set our back rules for that service account, they may need to, you know, explicitly allow the different things in the supply chain <laughs> to be created. Um, it yeah. may be a really dumb question, but would it be valuable for like uh discovery that a supply chain template can specify the can at least if well designed tell people what our back rules will be required so they could be collated i i think we could distribute the templates with cluster roles and then create like an aggregated cluster role for all the templates that the um in your namespace you could use a role binding to reference and so then then you wouldn't have to kind of deal with that problem. Uh, but it seems like this was different than I, what I, I thought it was. <laughs> I didn't mean to uh, uh, pull it in. With those, with those cluster roles, I think the when you say, then you could, I guess my question is, are we saying then you as the developer, which is what I think when I hear in the namespace that it's the developer's namespace. Um, because then it goes, it, I like I, I totally hear you. I think it makes total sense to have the templates to say, here are the permissions I need, and then to roll those up to the supply chain. The supply chain says, hey, I included this template. And so it's 
uh, its included roles are going to be bound to the service account that I'm using. And then when, when the developer's workload comes along and says, hey, I, I got this code, then cartographer is like, yeah, we'll, we'll stamp out your code. And you shouldn't need to know what permissions some template that you may never see require. I, I think there are a few things as part of that. Um, so somebody, or if the service account is in the namespace, because in, in both, both the case where the service account is specified in the supply chain and specified in the workload, the service account itself is, is always in the namespace. In the operator uh, case, the service account is just like a, a way to say the default service account name in the namespace is this. It's not setting an operator specified service account. And so that that's the, not, I don't think that's how we implemented it, right? Because we there, have a service account ref, so you could specify the namespace to pull the service account from. So the operator could configure the service account. But it, if you don't specify the namespace, then does it, it just picks the one in the namespace of the workload. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And that's, I, I thought that was kind of the configuration we were going to uh, advertise, but maybe that's a different, <laughs> different topic. Because um, if you use a shared service account across all workloads, then it, it you're kind of like, it's like a little bit of a privilege escalation. Users can specify configuration that gets embedded into the templates and run with something that has maybe more privileges than they, or has privileges across, you know, more than one namespace. Um, Similarly, maybe that's I a did, whole other thing. I did wonder, what, do we know what privileges we would expect developers to have? Whether they do we call out? Do they need to be able to create roles, or you know, what's the minimum set of privileges? Are that privileges that we, we think developers should have, so they can't because they won't be able to create a role potentially. To have that so it's definitely in a multi-tenant environment, developers will be unlikely to be able to create roles and role bindings because right. that itself is a privilege escalation. Yeah. Um, My mental model so, for this is like. Uh, operator provisions namespaces for developers. Those namespaces have a role binding to a uh, aggregated cluster role that gives, you know, the service account that's also created in the workload namespace access to create a specific set of resources, not all resources, within their namespace. Uh, and then the developer just creates the workload in the namespace. And so it's it's tightly restricted to the namespace. There's no shared. You're not sharing a service account between. You know, kind of many different principles and different uh, namespaces and developer doesn't have to create something they probably can't create. <laughs> but there are two alternatives. One which is that you could use a namespace specification to go and find it so that it's shared and that's at the supply chain level. Yeah, but this then... is the current truth, right? I just, I just wanted to understand what's there, and the other one is in a workload you can specify uh, within the specify. same namespace. I think all three of those a service account. Yeah, I think all three of those work with the current implementation. If you don't specify a namespace on a service account that's specified in the supply chain, it means use the service account in the namespace of the workload when you're creating the resources of that workload. The names allowing name allowing you to use a shared service account for all of them. I don't think is a, a bad idea. I could see that being useful on some platforms, right? Especially if you're like a smaller cluster with less developers or whatever. But I, I think it is inherently a less secure configuration because it allows you to get configuration <laughs> into you know something that's going to be set by um, a service account that has you know potentially access to you know, things outside of your namespace on the cluster, and so I. I, I don't know if I would recommend that configuration first, although I think we should document all three workflows and describe the implications. This is where I stuff. was going with this actually, because yeah. we have a story up for it. I think we're going to pull it today or soon to write something similar to our architecture document, something diagrammatic, something useful, something with warnings about what's best to use. And so we might ask, who wants to who wants to help us make sure that we get a good review on that? I'm going to ask you, Stephen. What about you, James? Uh, would you like to? Yeah, cool. So, yeah, whoever whoever does pick up that story, I suspect it might be me. But whoever does pick up that story, it would be great to uh, 
to yeah include James and Stephen on the review request for it, and then we can make sure that it's accurate and best in class or whatever we want to call it. You know, <laughs> putting the 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 least security model forward as much as we can, at least privilege. Sorry. Happy to help. Sure. Okay. Uh, the issue the issue is created okay. it's just when the uh when the pr oh. is created i'd just like to pull in some people david right. okay so that will be loop in ask for we could just yeah ask for a review from stephen and james from stephen and james that's just, great just fyi i'm only i'm only here two more days this year and then i'm back in the middle of january so um if i don't respond after that point i apologize just to not to stitch Scott up as well, but yeah, it might be a have might be useful to have another set of eyes as well, just from the happy to yeah, from that experience. Yeah. yeah, I was waiting for him to 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 actually I volunteer, just, but he no, just, I just went, Yeah, I just went for it. <laughs> okay, is there anything else you'd like to discuss, sure? No. Well, I, I just appreciate had one that. very, very quick thing. Sorry to, I, yeah. if it almost went, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll follow it up and add a comment. But I, I noticed um, on the troubleshooting, which is re looking really good, by the way, um, I think one of the things I've, I've felt with is hard to know sometimes where to go and look for the next debug message. And I just wondered if there's any brainstorming thoughts we could have around how do we almost kind of help users with the next command that they should run to go and look at you know, investigate further issues. Um, like it's a K-pack, you know, or it's an image thing. Is there a more helpful thing we can say, like run this command or I don't know. When they're open you know, source, they're... sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, not when they're open source, but when 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 they you know, are um... yeah, when they're they're like the likely thing to find in the supply chain that you're using in the open source project. I think we're working towards that. All right. Yeah. I mean we can, but the thing is is that it ought I feel like it's not in the troubleshooting. It's maybe in, if you happen to be using KPAC as one of your templates, here's troubleshooting for that stuff and we may create categories for that. But the broader troubleshooting is, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you all can say that this is probably a bad approach, but the approach I took with troubleshooting is at the moment to assume that it's just the, the you created your supply chain whatever it might be, you created your deliverable, whatever it might be. And you might just be using job and tecton. You might just be using, well, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, well where, where I was pondering with that was, could we, in, is there a way to catch what, uh, you know, in the error, uh, whenever we detect an error, we're about to update the message on, message status on the workload, to almost if we know the GVK to say, okay, run uh, kubectl describe, uh, oh. this this resource in this namespace kind of thing to help give the user the, the command to run to get the... So that uh, is in the troubleshooting. Yeah, that's what we tried to do though, right? Like the, the message yeah. that's there is basically everything minus the cube cuddle. Like right. we, we tried to have the, the group and every, you know, the namespace and everything so that they could just... That's our copy, goal, right there. Pay, yeah. Message, but, right, right there, status message. That waiting to revalue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you literally we formatted that in the in the sense that you would do a you would do a cube get. You could just copy and paste. That was very important, right? That's the thing that me and Emily focused on with that was like. And then we explained to do it. But you're saying maybe let's lift it all the way into the message. It's just it's an idea, command. yeah. Yeah, the actual the actual command. So somebody in their, their terminal would run. I think copy the issue. Paste, is yeah. So yeah, I think the, the the issue with that is that this message isn't necessarily an error, right? So like telling them to go run this cube cuddle command when we might just be waiting for the status to be filled in might be more misleading. Or we have to say all of that as well in the message. If this takes yeah. a long time, you might want to run. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe there's something just people thought I, like as we're doing things in the future. Just yeah, just little tips or something just to help uh, give a bit more information about people to go and find information and stuff. I know. Let's make sure that at the bottom of our status, if we're ever in unknown or or false, that we say see troubleshooting guide link to the website. 
take you straight there. We can even yeah. we could even embed links specifically to the ones that are most common. Like if we see a message for uh, yeah. what was that one? Um, missing yeah. value at path. Or we can take them straight to the anchor on that page for missing value at path. Do we hate that? Yeah. I mean, personally, I, I quite like I've done some of things in the past with their, with uh, health checks and things like that. It it, it helps, um, and maybe on the docs, then you can have, you know, there's go to the community if this is beyond or various. It's just giving people a bit more information of how to go find information. I mean, we can, maybe we can rift on it a little bit more, but it's just that initial thing, initial experience of okay, something's not quite right. Where do I go next? So maybe like you say, FAQ or like troubleshooting. That's a good initial step and we can try and get more informative in the status messages over time or something as long as it stays consistent i think it also just needs to be really easy to to make sure that we consistently apply new uh new guidance right and that would be gonna great. have to update the version in the link every time we release a new version uh i think the head the head will always be safe enough you know, we could always go to development um, actually, no, there's there's latest. the public version is latest, yeah. So slash latest works. What if you're running an old version? Um, then tough. Update your version. Oh. Yeah. 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 That's the first thing in all the live yeah, on edge. troubleshooting guide. <laughs> yeah, live on edge. <laughs> I shouldn't say tough, but you know, I think I think most of the time they shouldn't be so drastically misinformed by going to more recent troubleshooting for that for that message unless we do breaking changes and hopefully that will start to be a thing that we do in significant version changes speaking of which I... do we want to discuss the version number for the next release or is this not the forum i don't know I think it should be fine, but I, I put tree and queue logs in there. So <laughs> stick that under. Let's do that. Um, first. It, and I, I thought of this because of what you were asking about, James, how to help users troubleshoot even better. Um, uh, in some of our examples, like in some places in our code base, we do like talk about uh, uh, kubectl tree and how that can help you see the, uh, the dependency graph. Um, I don't know if we want to put that into our uh, into the troubleshooting guide as well. I'm not totally sure. Um, it, it may already be in there. Hmm? No, well, there's a, there was a strong bounce back for me on that because I was going straight there because nothing better than K-Tree, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem I run into is I think it's great to advise on it. And I think there may be a section on it is the right thing. But I definitely wanted to avoid then putting that everywhere. Like I don't want the troubleshooting section. You get there. And you start to use commands that you now have to make sure you've installed, right? I wanted it to be as, and, and so that's my guiding rule for this. And it could be that that shouldn't be it. We should say, look, minimum, you want to debug this thing, get tree installed because it really helps. But that was just so you know where I, my head was at with the first cut of this. It was kind of like, hey, can I, can I give people enough info to get them going? as though they're not using anything special. Maybe they're running on a, you know, on a business provided laptop or know, whatever the rules are, wherever the person lands, surely they've got kube cuddle. They might not have anything else, right? That was, that was the intention. So I think maybe putting, um, I think maybe like th there needs to be a section on understanding the, uh, the target objects, which is why the way we descend the tree in the first step on each of these bits of debug is, well, here's the output that tells you where, what the thing is that's being owned that we're waiting on, right? You don't need to look at the tree to see what the sort of like general status of things are, but maybe there should be a section on that. And there is actually a kubectl command that will give you a list of all of the things owned by another thing. And so, I'd, again, I'd probably try and use that over using tree and then maybe have a note, a footnote. Why don't you try using tree? It might look nicer for you. What do you think? Um, I One, that, that approach that you were talking about makes total sense to me. Yeah, let's, <laughs> uh, let's allow them to troubleshoot with, the, with any tool that they have. Um, I personally would 
push a little more forcefully on, hey, here's a great tool, um, not just in a note, but like, hey, the developers of a cartographer use Ktree all the time. Like, <laughs> like maybe you should too. Um, oh, maybe you could file an issue for that one, mm -hmm. just so that we track that. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Um, and then on a similar note, uh, there's this code that was written by folks that are on the team, Qlogs. Uh, some members of the team use it. I find it very useful. But yeah, essentially uh, a tool that will allow you to say like, here's the workload, what's going on in the logs of these objects that we've created. And it just tells you, um, one, is this the place to discuss like that tool? And two, if so, <laughs> uh, what do we think about making that tool available to others? I couldn't even get it to work. So it would have to be some effort on, on the behalf of our team to make sure that it's portable and usable. Do you have a link to that? Uh, I, I do. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's a private repo. Ah, no worries. Huh? We'd have to start maintaining it if we're going to tell people to use it, right? I mean, maybe the person who created it could create a public personal one. And I still think if it's not well maintained, then it's probably not something we should push as part of the project. But at least then it can be just mentioned, you know, in chat and that sort of thing. See if this tool works for you. Um, yeah. I'm also happy to put it on my public personal open source project if no one wants to host it somewhere. So I pop sites together for those sorts of things. Don't care. I mean, if it's useful, we should share it, especially mm -hmm. if we want someone to be able to use it. But I'm just not sure that we want to adopt. Is there an alternative? I haven't seen one. You just um, run the command for each object that was created. That's, <laughs> I mean, like, which is pretty standard, so. What are you looking for it to log? It doesn't log. It it reads logs. It gives you in the in like the same way that logs or yeah, in the same way that tree lets you see like hey, there's this dependency graph and like here's all the stuff yeah. in that graph. Q logs is like hey, here's that top like I just specify the top level objects and then it's like hey, here's the logs coming off of all these different child. Yeah, the the two tools I've used most commonly for that are either Kail, K-A-I-L, or Stern, S-T-E-R-N. Uh, and both of those will allow you to specify a label selector and basically just grab a bunch of pods. Um, or you can start getting more advanced. Like Kale will allow you to specify like the name of a deployment or the name of something else. And it'll basically just go find all the appropriate children. Um, <laughs> What's really nice about both of those is that it'll it has it sets up an informer for the pod. So as new pods come and go, it'll basically automatically show the output from them. Hmm. Okay, I'll I'll check these out. Thank you. Hey, uh, I think it's I see K A L E. I think it's supposed to be K A I L. Okay. Oh yeah, that's exactly what Sorry. I was saying. I, yeah, <laughs> I was going. I assumed kale, kale, like kale or logs. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Kubernetes tail. Yeah, that one. Okay. Great. Yeah, but you have to you have to agree that this logo is great. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um. Thank you. Um, okay, that will be next item, next version number, Marty. Yeah, so we're still on 0 .0 0.0.78, whatever we're listening. We're up to like eight now. So we have RCs out for 0 .0 0.0.8. When, when do we want to bump to like 
0.1 or 1.0 even. It would be nice to start following some ver for real at some point, preferably soon. Um, but if we don't feel like the API is stable enough yet, maybe we're not ready for 1.0. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like it is, but what do y'all think? Um, one, I mean, uh, there was a meeting where there, where we were asked to consider the name delivery and deliverable. Um, I would not, I would like to get buy-in on we're sticking with this or we're changing it before declaring 1.0. But I also don't know if it matters if we've, if we're gonna have to bump our, like, are, are we keeping the two versions? There's that uh, that summer version, and then there's the V1 alpha one. What what are we doing with that? Are we going to V1? We can save V1 alpha one, right? There's no reason to to bump that yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just say that most Kubernetes projects, much to my, I think it's rotten, but most of them never hit one, never hit 1.0, never hit V1. It's like, so when can I start trusting in Senver? So I'd love to see it. And I think it's a great thing to bring up, Marty. I also just think it's the thing that we need to say is our, one of the, one of our sort of like goals is to get to a one uh, 1.0. But to do so, mitigating risks of getting there too soon. I'm a little concerned about maybe there'll be some restructuring in our open source project as well that might mean some renaming. And it'd be frustrating if we went to 1.0 before we sort of thought about that. That's fair. But do we, even if those restructurings happened, would we expect to make breaking changes at this point? Or would we have you know, backwards compatible changes. I'd be wondering about the, about the GVK. That, that's all. I'd be wondering whether that was likely to change. Especially the G, but also the Ks. The Ks might change still. Maybe it's best to hold on a little bit and see what comes out of the coming weeks, I guess. Um, having a 1.0 does suggest to outside world that people can confidently build on top of this, I guess. Um, but I guess also the other thing I'd say is, I think there's two parts to the visioning. There's the, com like the component of Cartoff itself, it's also the APIs in, in there as well. So like the versioning of the of those APIs, like you said, there are other, like, other projects that probably are still on alphas or betas for their for their APIs. They still have they follow a different versioning approach to the project itself. So I also think there's um maybe we can find out some more. There's some I think there's some versioning suggestions as well from from a VMware point of view, but that might help out with some of it, give some help some guidance on other projects in the open source um Tanzu work that they're their approach they're taking. So maybe we can dig some of that up. Might help. Someone, I mean, I don't know about you, James, but would you be, or maybe David, someone be able to like troll the other open source projects for opinions? Yeah, can do this here. I've been taking action as well to, to kind of see if we can get some more information. If there's any guidance out there, I think there is some that's been talked about. So we'll see what we can find and which we can share. Got it. Anything, anything else? No. Okay, I really appreciate your time today and hope you have a good rest of the week. 
Thank you. See you later. Enjoy the rest of your holiday day, David. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure, I'll try. Thank you. Yeah.